Good evening, everyone, and welcome to My Abbey Offenses. I'm glad to be back once again this week. This is our fourth webinar tonight, and this is our final uh, webinar of this week, of course. And I'm glad to say that this is the third webinar with Dr. Vladimir Silva. So I'm very, very happy that you are back and will present one more presentation, share some cases, and of course, help out with any questions that you might have. Hello, Dr. Vladimir. Glad that you are back. Hope you are having a good day so far and are ready to educate us a bit more as yeah. again because uh, hi caroline uh, like always it's a pleasure to be here thanks uh, to the to the european fertility society for having me um i always like to to participate in this kind of webinars share our experience talk on different topics um and this particular series is one of the most exciting ones because it's, it is designed to talk about um, success stories, which I find inspiring and very important for those who are trying to have a baby. Probably if you are listening to this, <laughs> that's because you are either working in the IVF field or trying to have a baby. Um, but most likely uh, you are trying to get a baby. And so uh, I'm very happy to, to boost your confidence, your hope, and to explain a, li a little bit on a, on a very complicated topic. But I will talk definitely. about that later. Uh, exactly. We definitely, it's not an easy topic. Uh, and I'm sure there will be mo lots of questions. Uh, as you know, we will talk about recurrent implantation failure. And of course, Dr. Silva is right here for you to simply explain. And also, as he mentioned, I'm sure there will be some inspiring stories. So stay tuned. Uh, this is going to be recorded. And uh, remember that if you have anything that you would like to ask, you can do it now or you can do it during our Q&A session. I expect another interesting session for sure. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming in tonight. Uh, I know that some of you come here even almost almost every single day. So um, I do believe and I hope that it's going to be, again, useful for you. Thank you so much. And let's start sharing your presentation, Dr. Silva. Let's get going with our topic and our session tonight, okay? Okay. I believe Perfect. you are already seeing my... Yes. Desktop. Yes, we okay. do. Let's, let's have a look sign. at the presentation. <laughs> it's here. Okay. So... Wonderful. It's right here. I can see it. Here we go. Can you, you can see it right? Yes, okay. we can see that. Thank you so much. Let's get going. Okay, thank you. So, um, well, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks again for, for being here, for listening to me. Uh, today, we're going to talk about recurrent implantation failure, uh, solutions and success stories. Well, first of all, I'd like to say this is an incredible, complex and broad topic. There are books <laughs> written about this, okay? So uh, I can obviously uh, be nothing but superficial while talking about this. So if you have more specific questions, uh, you can use the, the Q&A section to ask me about it. I'll try to answer as best as I can. Uh, I will tell, uh, I will make a very quick overview patient oriented i will try not to be too technical um, on the different topics uh, and then i will tell you about three stories that have that are completely different so you can understand our rationale the way that we conducted the investigations the conversations with the patients the all the discussions of the case and so on so uh, first of all we have to know what are we talking about what is, uh, what is this recurrent implantation failure? Well, this is, this is actually a, a difficult question because there's no consensus in the scientific community about this. Normally, we refer to it as the failure to achieve a pregnancy after at least three embryo transfers with good quality embryos, or maybe uh, after the transfer of, uh, of three or four nice blastocysts. Or sometimes uh, we mix things because uh, some patients in the beginning have had have tried with their own eggs and had one or two good embryos and many not so good embryos. And then when we try again with one or two nice blastocysts, we're already talking about recurrent implantation failure and starting investigations. So it is very variable. It changes a little bit from a patient to the other in, let's say, in a more scientific point of view, the most consensual definition is this one 
the, uh, of having at least three failed embryo transfer with good quality embryos. Um, the f one of the things that we, we actually have to consider is that luck also counts because many times we're talking about recurrent implantation failure, but it could actually be just bad luck. For example, uh, this is a, and we know how, uh, how statistics work and, and how deceiving can be statistics and how can, can we play numbers to make uh, to draw whatever conclu conclusions we might we might want? For example, let's assume that a certain treatment has a sixty percent pregnancy rate. So we know that if we transfer one embryo to one hundred patients, we will get sixty of them pregnant and forty that will not pre be pregnant. If we do, if we transfer a second embryo to those remaining uh, remaining forty patients, we will have. 24 patients that become pregnant and 16 that will not be pregnant. And if we transfer a third embryo to those 16, we will end up with nine patients that are not pregnant, uh, the nine patients that are pregnant and seven patients that, that are not pregnant. This means that we have a 93% accumulated pregnancy rate, but obviously it was always 60%. So sometimes when we are talking about recurrent pr pregnancy rate, we are just having bad luck within this 60% pregnancy rate range. 60% is, is brilliant for every IVF clinic, for every, every uh, IVF treatment, but it still represents that 40% of the patients are, are not getting pregnant for random factors or factors that are difficult to control. We know that if we flip a coin five or ten or six times in a row, it might fall on the same side, size maybe five consecutive times. But we all know that if we flip that same coin 1,000 times, we will end up more or less with 500 times tails and 500 times heads. So uh, this means that when we are talking about IVF, we're talking about low numbers. Even if we transfer 10 embryos, which is uh, a lot of embryos, it's still a low number when we're talking about probabilities like 60, even 70%. There is, uh, so luck plays a very important role. And this is just to remember you that sometimes we're treating patients as recurrent implantation failure cases because they fill in the criteria but we are we are actually just um, just giving up on on pressure because obviously patients want to get pregnant patients want to have a baby as soon as possible when they came to the clinics they have already tried for a long time at home maybe they have started the treatment process elsewhere and for many years and so anxiety plays an important role the economic factor the emotional factor the the pressure of time and so there is a lot of pressure on patients and sometimes this is actually just bad luck okay but still let's take it to the scientific level so what causes recurrent implantation failure? So the truth is that we usually don't know. Uh, and when I say we, I'm talking in the name of uh, I, the IVF science. Uh, there are, uh, because we, there are so many factors involved that it's sometimes very hard to pinpoint just a single explanation. It could be a mix of factors. Uh, there are many, obviously many mixed situations, but essentially we can divide the problem in two groups of potential causes. The problems with the embryo that typically are associated with chromosomal abnormalities and problems in the uterus. This could be related to endometrial issues like the window of implantation, the uterine receptivity, anatomic in, anatomical anomalies, immune factors, thrombophilia, etc. We will talk about all of that during this presentation. So uh, how do we, we start our investigations when we are uh, trying to find a cause for a recurrent implantation failure? Well, 
normally we start with the embryo. It's important to be as sure as possible about the embryo quality. And the, the most important, the most, I wouldn't say important, but the most effective way to evaluate the quality or the potential, the implantation potential of an embryo is by doing a pre-implantation genetic testing for a nucleus. Yes, uh, two days ago I've talked about this, so I will not lose ma much time bothering you with the details of it, but uh, I will just explain how it works. So we, we create embryos in the lab, we fertilize the eggs with the sperm, uh, we culture the embryos until day five or day six to the blastocyst stage. At that moment, we, we make a hole in the embryo with a laser system and we withdraw a group of normally about five cells from the embryo. Those cells are then analyzed uh, in a genetics lab, and we look and we and we look inside of them to see how many chromosomes do we have inside those cells, and then we can see whether those cells have the right number of chromosomes or an extra chromosome or a, a chromosome missing. Okay, if an if a, if an embryo is has the correct number of chromosomes, it is called a neoploid embryo, euploid embryo. If, a, if an embryo has the wrong number of chromosomes, we call it a neoploid embryo, and a neoploid embryo, okay? So what's the difference? The difference is that if you transfer a normal, a chromosomally normal embryo with the right number of chromosomes, the probability of getting a pregnancy is very high. You can see this, this is a graphic from iGenomics, iGenomics is one of the most important genetics test providers in the world and they have published this graphic on their website uh, and you can see that the implantation rates uh, in the gray bars correspond to patients uh, who have done a PGTA, pre-implantation test for a nucleotis. This means that if you transfer an embryo that has been tested and is considered to be normal, the pregnancy rate will stay more or less the same across all of age groups. However, in the orange bars, you can see the results of pregnancy that you have when you are not testing the embryos. Uh, and you will see that there is a steep decline with age. Obviously, pre-implantation genetic tests doesn't make the embryos better. It doesn't increase the chances of an embryo to implant. However, it helps us to identify what is the best embryo. If the embryo has a good implantation potential or not, um, and it helps us, it helps us to select the best embryos to transfer. So it reduces the time for a pregnancy. It keeps us from losing time in low prognosis embryo transfer. Uh, it saves money to the patients ultimately, um, and so. Um, but at the same time, if the embryos are not good, it will not transform them into good embryos. Okay, so this is an indication. This is very useful to find an explanation for recurrent implantation failure cases. For example, if we're having consistently negative results and we test the embryos of a patient and we don't find suitable embryos, it's very likely that the problem is, is with the embryo. So it doesn't make sense to start looking for other factors because the, the explanation is probably on the embryo, okay? Obviously, uh, this is very related to the probability of having a delivery and inversely related to the probability of having a miscarriage. So when we are transferring embryos that, that have genetic abnormalities, the risk of having a miscarriage increases a lot. But, but uh, you should take in consideration that even when we transfer embryos that have been tested and proven to be viable, we're, we're not above 60%, okay? So there are this, still these 40% of cases missing for which we don't have an explanation. So the, the reason for these embryos not to implant 
is essentially on the uterus side. It could also be other non-genetic causes, problems with the embryo. I will not address that subject. I talked a little bit about that two days ago. But um, so besides a small portion of cases that are also justified by problems with the embryos, these 40% are essentially problems with the uterus or the endometrium or other implantation related causes. Uh, so this is why uh, when we have good embryos, so like I said, we should start with the embryo. When we have good embryos, then we, we, we should move our investigation into the uterus. And uh, one of the, from those factors that I've listed uh, two or three slides ago, uh, one uh, of the most important tests nowadays is the endometrial receptivity study. What is that? Um, we, when we are evaluating the, the endometrial receptiveness, the endometrium is the tissue that coats the inside of the uterus. All women have this tissue inside the uterus. It, it grows every month. If, if we don't have an implantation, it is eliminated, and that's what we call the period. Okay, and, and so this tissue, the endometrium, is renewed every month, uh, and so and it has to have proper characteristics to 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 allow for the implantation of a, of the of an embryo. And then, and so when we have, when we are evaluating, when we are assessing the receptiveness of the endometrium, we have to think about three important factors: the window of implantation, which, this, so because the endometrium is not always ready to receive an embryo, there is a, a special for a moment in time, a special, an interval in time, a, a time range, a time range where the endometrium is ready to receive and implant an embryo. Uh, then we have to assess the microbiome because all women have bacteria inside their uterus. It just has to be the right bacteria, okay? Because if we don't have the right bacteria, the uterus is then invaded by pathogenic bacteria or is at risk to be invaded by pathogenic bacteria. And that could develop, could lead to the, develop, to the development of a chronic endometritis. So these are two important factors that should be addressed as well while studying for the window of implantation. Either whether there is any active infection or the risk to develop one. Okay, so uh, one of the most known tests is the ERA test. The ERA test is a commercial name of a test from iGenomics. There are, uh, ERA is the acronym from Endometrial Receptivity Array. There are other tests in the market, the ERA map, and the ERA peak, and so on, and the WIND test in France. So there are lots of very similar tests in the market. At Ferti Central, we usually work uh, with the ERA tests. Um, and so this is, uh, it's about this test that I will talk to you about. So a little bit, this is also an image from iGenomics. This is just to explain how it works. In a normal uh, cycle, the cycle begins on day one. At, in, a, in a physiological cycle, women ovulate around day 14. And we know that more or less five days later, there is this theoretical window of implantation that typically occurs between days 19 and 21 of the cycle. Before that, the endometrium is what we call pre-receptive. After that, the endometrium is what we call post-receptive. Um, we know that three in every 10 implantation failure patients have a displaced window of implantation. And this is a very important information because um, uh, I would just explain that slide after, uh, because we know that if an embryo is not transferred inside the window of implantation, the odds of a pregnancy are significantly lower, as I will show you later. But what is that, the window of implantation? That is related to the, expo to the timing of exposure to progesterone. Because when we are preparing for, let's say, a frozen embryo transfer or an egg donation cycle, or even in a physiological cycle, there, is, there are two moments, uh, two phases in the, in the development of the endometrium. 
the initial phase, which is the proliferative phase, where the endometrium starts growing. Okay, it, it starts. The, it is very thin in the beginning of the cycle, and it grows thicker and thicker. And then there is a moment where a progesterone takes action. In a natural cycle, uh, the progesterone is produced by the corpus gluteus, which is produced, which is originated by the remnants of the, the ovulating follicle. In an artificial cycle, we add artificial progesterone. And we know that uh, in an artificial cycle, after five days of exposure to progesterone, the endometrium is ready to receive a day five embryo transfer which is this image. Obviously, uh, after th uh, three days of exposure to the progesterone, the endometrium is ready to receive a day three embryo transfer. What happens if there is a displacement in the, in the window of implantation? In some women, for example, we need an extra day for the endometrium to be ready to receive a day five embryo transfer. And sometimes we need to do that embryo transfer at 144 hours or at 168. That has happened to us in the past. Uh, so this is uh, this movement in the window of implantation is something that we have to control uh, with the with the ERA test. And and so what is this? We do uh, an endometrial preparation like we do we would do uh, in an artificial cycle or even in a natural cycle. And then on the day of the embryo transfer, instead of transferring an embryo. We do um, we do a small biopsy, uh, uh, and and so we take a little piece of tissue. With that piece of tissue, we um, we analyze it in, in the in the genetics lab, um, and then uh, we iGenomics uses an array of two hundred and forty eight genes to detect uh, for the endometrial receptivity. And so uh, they will say uh, they will tell us whether the uh, that profile corresponds to uh, a viable endometrium or not. Uh, and obviously that leads to a personalized window of implantation. We should transfer the embryos according to the instructions that we receive from iGenomics. This is the conclusion of many 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 studies that they have done. So uh, when we are doing the, um, the ERA test, the, the reports that we receive are typically like this. This is actually a real example. For example, in this case, the endometrium was considered to be pre-receptive. And the recommendation was the personalized embryo transfer of a blastocyst should be performed with 143 hours of progesterone administration. Okay, so one day later than the time at which this endometrial biopsy was performed. So this is a typical example of a patient who had a pre-receptive endometrium. In some cases, the endometrium could be post-receptive or obviously receptive if, it, if they fall within the 120 hours. Um, the live birth rates with or without the personalized embryo transfer are completely different. For example, in this study from iGenomics, they were showing that uh, a personalized embryo transfer uh, wa was um, uh, 14 percentual points above uh, a frozen embryo transfer done uh, after 120 days, but without testing the endometrium, and the, accumula the cumulative rate was even higher. The difference with the cumulative rate was even higher. So uh, it is uh, a very important way of optimizing the, the uterine conditions. Uh, like I said, they have found, iGenomics has found in their studies, that this affects three in every 10 cases. Uh, normally, we refer to this test only the patients who have had three previous failed implantation, three, uh, three previous failed um, uh, embryo transfers. That's the initial criteria of the definition of recurrent implantation failure. Like I said, we're not too strict on this. In some cases, if we're transferring brilliant embryos or embryos that are proven to be euploid and we're not getting a pregnancy, we immediately do this. Sometimes, for example, uh, 
two days ago I was talking to a patient. Uh, we all, she's uh, 40 or 41 years old right now. We only had one viable embryo after pre-implantation genetic testing treatment. And what I told her was this, this embryo is very precious. And so we should test your, we advise you to test your endometrium before transferring it for two reasons. First of all, because we don't know if we will ever ever get another viable embryo from her eggs again because of her age. Uh, and also, and so it would, it's a, a huge responsibility and obviously uh, it is very important to give as many chances as possible to this maybe last embryo that her ovaries are producing. So this is uh, a type of test and a type of technique that we use many times uh, in our um, in our clinical practice. Uh, we don't use it for every patient. We don't use it as a first line approach, but it's a very important resource. The other, th the, uh, on a second level, we have the microbiome and uh, and the chronic endometritis. Um, this is again information from my genomics. Thirty percent of infertile women have pathogenic bacteria in their uterus. Uh, we all, like I was saying before, we need um, all women have bacteria. It is normal to have bacteria inside the uterus, but they have to be the right bacteria. Because when we have lactobacillus, like in on the right hand example, we know that uh, we have a, the optimal microbiome. And so uh, the bacteria inside the uterus are the right ones and they keep the bad ones from coming in. When we have uh, imbalances or pathogenic bacteria, the, the implantation condi conditions are not optimal. And so these two tests are connected. The EMA test is about testing for the microbiome. The ALICE test is about testing for chronic endometritis. And we can do it everything at the same time using the same piece of tissue to test for the window of implantation, for the presence, for the microbiome, and an eventual presence of chronic endometritis. And so with one, with just one procedure, we can test for everything at the same time. And obviously we can correct this. For example, this is an example case where a patient uh, has had no endometritis, but she still had a low percentage of lactobacillus. So we had to give her probiotics and, uh, and um, we had to give her probiotics. If there was some pathogenic bacteria here, we would also have to give her anti antibiotics. Um, then we have the anatomical anomalies. Um, what is that? Some women can they can be born with that. They can acquire that through life. But um, we do uh, an exam that is called an hysteroscopy um, <coughs> to try to see if we have polyps, if we have. Endom uh, chronic endometritis, it's another way of taking a little piece of the endometrium. If we have myomas, also known as fibroids, if we, had if we have adhesions, if we have adenomyosis that are parts of the uterus where there is no endometrium, any kind of malformations, like for example, septum and so on. Um, and so some of these things can be corrected surgically, some don't, and some can, but we shouldn't do it. Because we always have to balance because, uh, between trying to optimize uh, the uterine conditions as much as we can, or taking the risk of being too invasive. For example, in this study, uh, there is they, prove, they have proven that there is no doubt that, generally speaking, congenital uterine abnormalities can lower the reproductive outcome, okay, regardless of the type of congenital abnormality, uterine abnormalities. However, uh, for example, in this other study from the Cochrane Library, they have seen like, uh, for example, in the case of uh, hysteroscopic septum resections, uh, 
there is no evidence that uh, that uh, this kind of surgical procedure can can uh, can improve the reproductive outcome so sometimes uh, intervening is too much sometimes uh, it, it pays off okay it has to be evaluated on a, an individual patient basis what's the solution the, the answer to this question for a given patient is certainly different uh, from the answer to another patient there are cases where it makes sense to do the, to do surgical interventions there are cases where it doesn't make sense okay we have to make the decisions our gynecologists have to assess it properly sometimes they do mris they do ultrasound scans they do hysteroscopies they do laparoscopies depending on what they're looking for and then based on the observations that they get they will make the decision on whether it makes sense or not to do a surgical intervention and try to correct the problem so um on a third level uh, of, uh, I would say, importance and likelihood, then we have the immune and hematological tests that uh, about which we hear a lot of uh, information in the internet and patients ask us a lot about the, these tests. Then here we have the NK cells. In France, for example, there is the matrice lab test, which is a test about the immunitary environment at the, at the uterine level. We have the KIR HLA tests that um, that many patients do uh, we have packages of tests designed to screen for autoimmune diseases or autoimmune factors or parameters we also have screening packages for thrombophilia either acquired other uh, or genetic um, so or hereditary uh, so there is a lot of tests uh, that can be done in our opinion, these are not first-line tests. When we have three implantation, three negative results in the past, it could make sense to do these tests. We, we request them a lot, okay? We're not against it. Actually, we ask for these tests quite often. Quite often, sometimes when patients get here, even before they start uh, a treatment, when they tell us stories like, I've tried five times elsewhere and so on, uh, we start, we can even start the, before doing any kind of treatment, we can start by asking them to do these tests, okay? So this can be very important, but, we have to use them to target these tests very well. It doesn't make sense to do all tests to all patients. We have to understand which test is important for which patient because not all patients are the same, not all infertility stories are the mm -hmm. same, and in some situations we find it very likely to find problems at one of these levels, and in other cases the the most likely explanation is elsewhere okay and so in medicine we have to i mean the number of potential tests are, is almost endless um, and so we need to be careful and we need to test exactly for what uh, we uh, for what makes sense because otherwise we will lose months and a lot of money in useless tests uh, because at the end of the day, what we all want is this. This is a, a picture of a blastocyst. This was taken out from this scientific article where we, we see an embryo implanting in the uterus and building the connection, the, ne the network of vessels. Um, and so this is what we are all looking for. So now I'm going to share with you those stories uh, about success stories. Uh, obviously, all names of the patients are fake uh, to protect the patient's identity. And we will start with the case of Jenna. Jenna was 42 years old when she came to the clinic. She already had five years of infertility. She was married. I forgot to mention that. Uh, she had two previous miscarriages. Uh, she had multiple fibroids. So the first thing we had to do was to remove those fibroids because typically we don't, we're not in IVF. I believe all IVF doctors will tell you more or less the same, but IVF doctors are generally against invasive procedures. 
they don't like to, um, to to touch the uterus, they don't like to do too much interventions, but there are situations where we cannot avoid that. For example, in the case of Jenna, she had submucosal, submucus, well, I don't know the word in English, but her fibroids were interfering with the uterine uh, cavity. And so we had to remove them um, surgically. Actually, it was not only a laparoscopy, but also a laparotomy because she had so many fibroids. Also, this patient had a very low ovarian reserve, but her ovaries were still working. So we did a couple of cycles to accumulate eggs and then do the pre-implantation genetic testing for a new uh, We ended up having one blastocyst and unfortunately that blastocyst was not viable. It had four different uh, ab genetic abnormalities. So uh, we did uh, an ectonation treatment since because, since Jenna already had two miscarriages and the, and a, near, uh, a case of uh, an abnormal blastocyst in a previous PGTA case, we filed for an authorization request to do uh, preimplantation genetic tests in in the ectonation case as well. We got three blastocysts, and unfortunately, they all were uh, aneuploid, meaning they all had a wrong number of chromosomes. So we discussed the situation with the patient. We considered the possibility of doing double donation. Um, they didn't want that. We also discussed the possibility of this being just bad luck, like I was saying in the beginning. The patients wanted to give another try, okay, and we agreed with that because Actually, this was just one attempt. It could well be bad luck. And so we did another egg donation cycles and uh, also with brain plantation genetic testing again. And in fact, everything went well. We, ha we had six blastocysts. Five of them were euploid. They were viable. We this was a wonderful result, uh, a lot more than we could expect in the beginning. So we were very happy for Jenna and her husband. However, we did the first frozen embryo transfer of a euploid blastocyst and the result was negative. You have to see where we were at this moment because, I mean, this was a very complicated patient with a horrible uterus, okay? And so we corrected the uterus, but she already had the miscarriages before the uterine corrections. So we initially we had reasons to believe that maybe the miscarriages were caused by the uterine conditions. This is why we agreed to use the patient sex and do the PGTA. When we didn't get viable embryos, we moved with egg donation. When we found out that the embryos were not viable, we started thinking about the sperm. The sperm was not ideal, but it was not terrible as well. So uh, we ended up trying with another donor and we get six blastocysts, five of them were viable. And then we thought, well, this is the explanation. This is why this treatment, this treatment wasn't working in the first place. So uh, we did... Um, we did another embryo transfer. We did an embryo transfer without further testing because finally we had viable embryos and we were disappointed because the result was negative. Then we moved on with the ERA test. Uh, and then we thought that the endometrium was only receptive at 144 hours. So this was, um, this was actually good news because there was something in which we could intervene. At the same time, we asked for, uh, we prescribed lots of tests, but in the thrombophilia screening panel, there were multiple positive results. So uh, we, we referred the patient to the hematologist and the hematologist in uh, her consultation <coughs> developed an individualized prophylactic protocol because this patient, she had a family history of people with strokes and with, um, with, hemato with hematological disorders actually. And so the hematologist developed her own protocol. And then we moved on. We did the next frozen embryo transfer, respecting the indications from the ERA test and using the prophylactic protocol for 
the hematologist and we immediately got a healthy pregnancy with the birth of a baby boy and Jenna and her husband still have um, uh, three or four, I think it's three, uh, exactly three uh, great embryos that allow them to have another baby. Then we have the case of Pauline. Pauline is a young a younger patient, 30 years old. She came to the clinic uh, after having two previous miscarriages and also because she had polycystic ovarian syndrome. So she she could spend two or three months without having her menstruation. And on top of that, there was also a, a male factor. Um, the patient, uh, the patients didn't want to do pre-implantation genetic testing because they were against it for ethical reasons, and so uh, we started the ovarian stimulation because Pauline had a, P a PCOS. We had to, we couldn't do the embryo transfer immediately, so we ended up freezing six very nice blastocysts and we frozen them all. And then we prepared Pauline's womb to do the embryo transfer. We transferred the first blastocyst, we got an ongoing pregnancy, and then she miscarried at around eight weeks or nine weeks or so. So this was her third miscarriage. When we get to the third miscarriage, there is uh, an indication for further tests. We, di we discussed this with Pauline and her husband. They didn't want to do further tests, and so we moved on with frozen embryo transfer number two, and we've transferred them another blastocyst, and the result was negative. So we talked with the patients again. There were some lifestyle corrections. They, uh, in terms of nutrition, they were not living a very healthy life, uh, th and then we decided to and the patients rejected further tests, so we decided to give them a prophylactic protocol with, um, with probiotics and antibiotic, uh, because there was already three miscarriages, so we couldn't exclude completely the risk of any underlying infection in there. Uh, we used the high dosage progesterone protocol because we were not sure whether the problem was the progesterone levels after the embryo transfer were borderline and so we decided to increase the dosage of progesterone and then we immediately got an ongoing pregnancy and the healthy boy is already born and we still have some embryos for them so it's also a very interesting success story. Then we have the case of Natalie. Natalie was 44 years old when she came to the clinic. She had a very low ovarian reserve and she and so we advised her to go through egg donation. We obtained four blastocysts, which is a normal and very good result. We did the first sing elective single embryo transfer and the result was negative. Then we thought this was just bad luck, probably, and we've transferred her another fantastic blastocyst, and the result was negative again. Uh, she didn't yet fill the criteria for recurrent implantation failure, but we were not comfortable with the situation because we only had two more embryos, and actually the first two were probably the best two embryos. The, the embryos were wonderful. And so we did her the endometrial test, which is a mix of the ERA test for the window of implantation, the EMA test for the lactobacilli for the microbioma and the Alice test for the chronic endometritis. And so we found out that her endometrium was only receptive after 146 hours of progesterone and she only had 26% of lactobacilli. So uh, on top of that, we screened her for immune factors and we accidentally found out that she's a carrier for an autoimmune disease. We had to refer her to a specialized consultation for that. Uh, she had no symptoms nor any knowledge that she was a carrier for that condition. And we also found a mutation in the factor five in the thrombophilia screening. So we ended up finding a lot of uh, abnormal factors in the case of Natalie. And so 
we corrected everything. We did a third elective single embryo transfer, uh, respecting the indications from the error test, using the protocol of probiotics and antibiotics recommended by the IMA test, and then we we used a, a treatment protocol adapted for thrombophilia and autoimmune patients, and an healthy baby girl was immediately born. It was a very successful story. Natalie still has another embryo. She's now 48 years old. She has to move on if she wants to do the embryo transfer before the age of 50, which is the legal limit in Portugal. And so thank you for listening to me. We are waiting for you at Ferti Centro. Please don't hesitate to contact us if you need additional information. <laughs> And again, thank you so much. Uh, amazing stories as well. And thank you so much also for explaining all those uh, details and how recurrent plantation failure can be um, coped with as well. Uh, thank you so much. As always, it's a thank you, uh, presentation. So thanks. And let's have a look. As you can see, lots of questions are right here. So let's get going. I think it's always the favorite part of all the patients. So let's go. <laughs> Um, okay, regards from Portugal, I'm going to do IVF this month. I'm 43, don't ovulate no more and have two daughters, but we want to have one more. I'm afraid of the failure. Anything you can advise? Uh, well, Joana, um, what we can do is this. Um, I don't know if you're doing IVF with your own eggs or with donor eggs. Um, so the first thing we have to do is to assess uh, your ovarian reserve to see if your ovaries are still working. Um, if they are still working, we can do, uh, we have to, to move on as fast as we can. Uh, we should use uh, an aggressive ovarian stimulation cycle. Um, if you are willing to do that, we can even do you more than one stimulation in order to accumulate. Uh, okay, so uh, we will use donor X. Uh, okay, so with donor X, uh, it's different. So we get, uh, I mean, Joanna in th changing to donor X is a is a game changer because uh, when we have uh, when we work with donor X the odds immediately uh, climb up to 60 or maybe 70 percent depending on the the context of the patients and uh, joanna has in her favor uh, two two positive factors first of all the fact that she already has two daughters okay so she has proven that she's capable of receiving a, an embryo and implanting an embryo and taking a pregnancy to term and she has done that twice uh, i don't know if the father is the same or not but uh, if so her partner has, is, has already proven that he's a fertile person that can give birth uh, to, to to viable babies. Um, so in principle, I wouldn't advise her to do any further tests because she has apparently everything to become a good prognosis patient. Okay, so our advice would be to, to just move on with uh, egg donation, creating the embryos, do a standard protocol, because in principle, this seems to be a good prognosis case. Obviously, if she was using her own eggs, my speech would be completely different, okay? Of course, thank you so much, okay? Thank you, and of course, fingers crossed for you. Okay. Good luck, yes. Joanna. <laughs> Definitely, mm -hmm. and many thanks from her for you. Okay, let's have a look. We have a question from Shelby. Uh, thank you so much. I'm back to receive some more wisdom from you. I was wondering if you recommend mini IVF for patients over 40. My first normal IVF fate, I'm 40 and my MH is 0 0.83, FSH is 4.7. I ended up with 7X and two-day three embryos, which didn't implant. I'm wondering if a lower stimulation might produce a higher quality egg. Um, so... Um... I don't, well, uh, thank you, Shilpi, for uh, listening to me for the third time this week. Uh, so it's always a pleasure to have you here. Uh, like I was saying uh, in the past, I don't know, we, we really don't know. She had two day three embryos and we don't know whether they would make to it to the blastocyst stage or not. Uh, 
assuming that they wouldn't because the, the pregnancy result was negative, uh, I think the only way is to try. On the other hand, uh, with 0 0.83 of AMH and 4.7 of FSH, uh, despite the 40 years of age, I think there is still room. It makes it still makes sense to try um, conventional IVF with an aggressive, a more aggressive uh, ovarian stimulation. But we can also try, uh, and, and certainly pre-implantation genetic testing for a nucleotis, PGTA. Uh, so if she, if she can't do this or she doesn't want to do PGTA or if it's too expensive, uh, we can also try the mini IVF. Mini IVF was a technique that was mm, very... Mm, Everybody was talking about it like 10 years ago or so, because theoretically speaking, uh, we could obtain just one or two eggs of better quality instead of seven, for example, like Shilpi mentions here, with a lower quality. Nowadays, the tendency worldwide is to uh, the more eggs we can get, the better. But um, I've seen a lot and uh, I've worked in this field for 18 years now and I've seen things, uh, people saying one thing and then the opposite and th theories being ad abandoned and get, uh, and getting back on, on, on the international congresses. And so what I would say is this, um, I don't think this is a stupid idea, okay? It's a respectable strategy and a respectable idea. In at our clinic at Ferti Centro, we usually don't do it. We prefer to try uh, a more aggressive stimulation in these circumstances because our experience uh, works better. In our experience, these work better. But there's nothing like trying. Okay, and good luck, Shelby. Definitely. Okay. Thank you so much for yet another question from you and thanks for the help. And let's have a look. Another question. We are in Colombia. We have a problem in Colombia. The medication used for endometrial pre preparations are changed every month for drugs. Laboratories combine estrogen preparation, even dermic patches, gel and spray may affect the window of implantation and pregnancy rate instead of the oral estrogens. Um, well, the, the window of implantation is more about the progesterone. It's not so much about the, the estrogens. But obviously, we, we prefer to... Uh, the principle behind the era test and the other tests like that is that under the same type of protocol, the women's endometrium will behave the same way. And they before they, they started making, doing this test, they, they were all... Uh, a lot they were they tested it in thousands of patients i don't know exactly how many and they have confirmed that the cycles were reproductive and so um in principle um we the women's uterus will respond the same way to the same type of strategies our advice is to try to do things always the same way so if you start with transdermic patches you should stay with transdermic patches. If you start with uh, tablets, you should stay with tablets and so on. It is never good to change the, the way of administration of the estrogens from a cycle to the other, but still uh, the estrogens are not the critical factor. What I would definitely change is the way of implantation of the progesterone. If you're using injectable progesterone, you should always keep injectable progesterone. If you're using it in gel, you, you should keep it in gel. If you're using it uh, in tablets like we do in Portugal, you, you should stay in tablets. But so progesterone is more critical than estrogens. But uh, um, but aside from that, uh, so if, if you can keep the same strategy, keep it. If you cannot, because medicines are not available, don't worry too much, as long as you can keep the, the progesterone way of administration steady, uh, dosage and way of administration. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for coming in here. Yeah, Colombia is definitely far away. So mm -hmm. I hope that that was helpful. So thanks a lot. Indeed. And good luck, Jorge. Mm -hmm.
as always, right? We always try mm -hmm. to keep our fingers crossed for everyone. So, um, okay, let's have a look. One other question. What are the good bacteria of the uterine microbiome? The lactobacillus. That you mentioned, of course, you explained yeah, this, but thank you so much for the confirmation here. And yeah, let's have a look at the next one. Um, if we don't have a period, we don't ovulate, when is the good time to do IVF? Uh, there is no problem with that. We can do artificial cycles. Uh, and so we do what we call hormonal replacement cycles. Everything is artificial. You don't need to ovulate since you're doing treatment uh, with donor eggs. Ovulation is, for, is to produce eggs. So since we are using donor eggs, the eggs are already there and we will create the embryos in the lab. So we just need to prepare your endometrium, your uterus to receive and implant an embryo. So don't worry with that. Uh, IVF with egg donation can even be, be used in women, uh, in, mes in menopausal women. So um, by doing ultrasound scans and programming the cycle very well with the right hormones, uh, we can control timings. Don't worry, all doctors, uh, your doctors uh, will certainly uh, be able to identify the best moment. Obviously, we need the endometrium to be at least eight millimeters thick. Sometimes there are patients who can never get to that, but we will, there are different strategies to, to, to improve the endometrial conditions. Excellent. Thank you so much for uh, explaining this once again here. And let's have a look. Another question. I was prescribed two milligram progesterone to estrogen for four days before my day three embryo transfer beginning on egg retrieval day. Since the implantation failed, would you say the fault could be with the embryos and the endometrium or both? We will never know. Okay. Uh, we, I mean, obviously, uh, if we're transferring a day three embryo transfer, we would definitely recommend that uh, the embryo transfer would be done after three days of progesterone, unless there was an, a test, a window of implantation test that says otherwise. Okay, so uh, assuming that your window of implantation is not displaced, I would say that. Uh, you, you, first of all, you shouldn't think about days. You should think about hours, okay? A day three embryo should be transferred after 72 hours of progesterone. That's the most important. Um, so if, it's, if it was transferred at 96 hours, for instance, uh, then maybe it was too late. I don't know. I, I would have to know the results of your endometrial, of your window of implantation. Um, so if that was the case, if the embryo, if the embryo transfer was not done in the right moment, this could also, this could actually be a reason. Excellent. Again, thank you so much, of course, for yet another question. Um, okay, let's have a look at the next right here. Can I take prednisolone in the treatment for the transfer of a frozen embryo, even though I am lactose intolerant? And are there risks for the implantation i am starting the treatment tomorrow <laughs> oh my god well safia um first of all this is a, a question to to ask the the doctors that you're doing treatment with but uh in principle prednisolone um well prednisolone for those who who don't know what it is is a, a steroid a, a, a powerful anti-inflammatory drug we use we sometimes use it in cases where there is the risk of immune rejection of the embryo. Sometimes we use it just as a prophylactic approach. Um, and yes, we we use it a lot in frozen embryo transfer cycles. And as far as I know, there is not a relationship with lactose intolerance. However, I'm not a specialist on this field, but I can only say that. I've never heard of it. I can never. I cannot say that uh, it, it doesn't exist for sure. Uh, honestly, I don't think it should be any problem. But I would need to to take a better look to to be able to to answer in a more definitive way. 
All right. Understood, of course. Perfectly. Thanks a lot. And good luck, Safia. <laughs> yes. Best of luck. It's All tomorrow. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. Fingers crossed, as always. Right. So, thank you. And okay. Sophie has another question. What about scratching PRP procedure? Uh, well, scratching was something that we were doing a lot until more or less four or five years ago. Uh, and we did it a lot for maybe 10 years or seven or eight years. Uh, initially, scratching had very promising results. These days, and especially in recent years, there was some research published that uh, it, in, for most patients, it, it didn't improve results. For certain patients, it could actually be worse. Um, and the group of patients for whom this could be beneficial was very short and very specific. So uh, at our clinic, we're not doing it anymore. So we stopped doing scratching like five years ago or so. PRP procedure is a little bit the opposite. It's a new treatment. Um, PRP stands for platelet enriched plasma. Uh, okay, so um, it is important, well, theoretically speaking, obviously. Uh, PRP can be used either inside the uterus for women with very thin endometrium or injected directly in the ovaries in women with low ovarian reserve. Um, I don't have any experience with this personally, nor our clinic. Uh, we've had patients who have done this in other clinics in collaboration with us, and um, the results were not so great. But still, there is a lot of uh, recent publications mentioning uh, very good results with PRP. So I would say that PRP could be the future, okay? Um, this is, I don't... The result, the, the studies that are published are all very recent and have low numbers of patients, but the results seem really promising. So I would say that PRP could could be could be part of the future of IVF. I don't think scratching will be done for much longer. Uh, it tends to be abandoned. Okay, thank you so much for the explanation. I just want to mention that if you are interested in the topic PRP, we had some uh, webinars and uh, I know that there were some clinical studies mm -hmm. in Cyprus, Ukraine, you can check it out and yeah. see mm -hmm. if it's something that uh, if it's something that you can, uh, that you are interested in, sorry. <laughs> and of course, this thanks from Sophie. Good luck, Sophie. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. And let's have a look, okay? Uh, Sebastian has another question here. Which probiotics do you give? How long and which mode of application? Which antibiotic treatment do you apply in case of chronic endometritis? What is your thrombophilia protocol? Oh my God, Sebastian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, um, so starting from the beginning, uh, normally when we work with iGenomics, they give a list of probiotics that are available uh, in many places around the world. Uh, Probiotics don't have the same name everywhere, uh, depending on the country that you are. Um, typically, we use the ones that are that are used for either for seven days or for fourteen days. Uh, okay, uh, it, they are given. They are used intravaginally at night, um, and so and we don't make we don't really make a distinction between between different types of probiotics. So uh, all of them can be suitable. We we don't we cannot say that a certain probiotic is better than the other. Regarding antibiotics, it will depend on the bacteria that's causing the endometritis. Uh, normally, uh, when we get the results from, from, from the biopsies that I've identified the presence of pathogenic bacteria, we also get the list of antibiotics that, uh, that work against them. So it's not always the same. Sometimes we use amoxicillin, sometimes we use metronidazole, sometimes we use azithromycin. So there are uh, plenty of, um, of antibiotics that can be used. Um, and so regarding thrombophilia protocol, it's a little bit the same because uh, we work with uh, hematologists. Uh, we 
we don't have a standard protocol for all patients, uh, but typically these protocols use heparin, they use aspirin, and they use steroids. Okay, the dosages and the regimes are variable according to the patients, uh, according to many factors, also the type of thrombophilia that is identified because not all thrombophilia are the same. And not only in the dosage of this medication is not always the same from the beginning of the cycle to the end of the cycle. So um, this is not the very immediately and, uh, and easy to answer question. Okay, but uh, there are plenty of things that pl plenty of different things that can be used. Excellent. Again, thank you, Sebastian, for those questions. And thank of you, course, yes. Yep. Thank you, indeed. And let's have a look. Okay, one more from Sophie. I'm 42, and I will use a sperm donor. Belgium past one and a half year already had 10 placements of which two miscarriages. I have had three pickups with a five embryo each time, day three or day five. Last time, six five day embryos of good quality, but no success. Three of them just defrosted poorly. What would you recommend for me? Give up my own eggs and use donor eggs. Well, this is actually a very difficult uh, question because uh, in, on one hand, uh, on Sophie has a lot of embryos, but uh, we don't know uh, whether they are viable or not because, well, at least she doesn't mention it here, uh, but pro probably she has not done uh, PGTA. So we don't know whether these embryos uh, are viable or not. They have a correct uh, genetical constitution or not. So we don't know if they are failing to implant because the embryos are just not viable or because the uterus is not um, uh, is not uh, or because the uterus uh, is not that receptive. So uh, my advice, but on the other hand, it is true that she has lot uh, she has done three pickups and so a lot of embryos, a lot of ovarian stimulation. these are very aggressive treatments emotionally, certainly financially. Uh, so uh, all situations, uh, okay, okay. Uh, so no PGTA. So, uh, Sophie, first of all, this is a very personal decision. My advice is this. If for you it is really important to try to have a, to have a baby with your own eggs, my advice would be to do another ovarian stimulation, take the embryos to day five, do PGTA. If you find viable embryos, then you should start, we should start focusing on the endometrium. Do the ERA test, do the microbiome evaluation, do the, the chronic endometritis screening. Uh, if, that, uh, if there are no explanations from that, maybe we can do a scan for immune factors, Care tests, etc., uh, etc., et and and uh, and only transfer the embryos after excluding for all of these potentially confounding factors. That would be definitely our advice. Uh, if for you it is more important to move on with this and have your own family and uh, forget all of the past treatments and so on it is obviously advisable to move on with egg donation. You've tried three times. It's a very sensible number of attempts. Um, like I said in, in, in my presentation, PGTA doesn't improve the quality of the embryos. It just gives us information on that. And if the embryos are not good, uh, there's nothing we can do. So IVF clinics cannot make eggs and sperm. We can only mix them. And so if we have a problem in, in one of the cells, there's nothing we can do about it. So my advice is this. If you still have the energy and the stamina to try again, maybe you can try again because you are getting eggs and embryos. Uh, if you are tired and if you want to move on and have a family as soon as possible, then move on with egg donation. And of course, thank you so much. And thank you for this great advice. Thank from you, Sophie. Sophie. Perfect.
thank you. Okay, and there's a question I missed previously, apologies, and here it is. Uh, if not, if I'm not mistaken, PGTA is not recommended for donor eggs. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it's not done. And yet you found that a large percentage of embryos were unemployed. Do you think it's important to do PGTA for egg donors every time? No, no, uh, I agree. Uh, we don't recommend PGTA for donor eggs as well. In the example that I gave, there was, it was a, case, a very particular situation because first of all, it was a patient who had had two miscarriages at an age where she was still, uh, maybe I didn't give that detail, but she, she, she had the same age of the egg donors, okay? And she miscarried twice. Uh, and then uh, she did, uh, we did an, a treatment with her own eggs and, and there, none of the embryos was viable. The, we did PGTA and they were all abnormal. And so it was because of this very particular situation and context that we did PGTA in the egg donation case. Uh, and actually, uh, in the first uh, cycle that she has done, uh, out of three blastocysts, none was viable. And in the second cycle, out of six, five were viable. So, um, and two days ago when I was talking about PGTA and egg donation, uh, and also today in one of the slides that, I, that I've showed, uh, we have seen that uh, PGTA uh, below the age of 35 doesn't make much of a difference. And all egg donors have less than 35 years old. So no, I don't recommend PGTA for egg donation. I don't think it really makes a difference. Maybe it is useful when we have a lot of embryos and we need to prioritize them. Uh, then there are regulatory issues. For example, in Portugal, in order to do PGTA with egg donation, we need a special permit. We, in the case of the first patient, we had to submit to file for that permit and the Portuguese IVF authority authorized us, but we had to explain why we were requesting that because uh, without the proper uh, explanation, they wouldn't have allowed us, okay? So it was a very, very specific situation. It's not something that we can generalize for all patients. So uh, globally speaking, I would say PGTA is not recommended for donor X. Uh, I, I definitely agree with that. <laughs> yep, thank you. I forgot about that. Thank you so much indeed. And um, let me just go to the question from Sebastian, okay, because of course he had the previous questions and this is the uh, question, how long and which dose of amoxicillin do you apply? Sebastian, I can't answer that because it will depend on the bacteria and the recommendations that we have. Uh, I mean, typically, it's about a week uh, and we, uh, in, uh, I honestly don't remember, but I believe it was 500 milligrams uh, every eight hours or I don't know. I would have to take a look because this is, uh, these protocols are tailor-made. They are different according to the patient. Uh, so what's valid for a patient is not necessarily valid for, for another one. Uh, sometimes we mix the moxicillin with clavulanic acid. Sometimes we give it alone. Uh, it's uh, it, it's uh, sometimes we give it every twelve hours. Sometimes we give it every eight hours. Uh, uh, typically, eight days or a week is okay for this kind of uh, chronic endometritis. But there are situations where we have to do longer therapies. Uh, it's really variable. Unfortunately, I cannot give you a, a, a definitive answer. That's understandable. Thank you so much, <laughs> Sebastian, for following, following up on that. And thank you. And let's have a look, okay? There is another question about ERA tests. So thank you so many useful information. I'd like to ask how important is ERA test, uh, especially if there was failed implantation in the past. Not all clinics are suggesting this. Uh, I mean... There are other tests, okay? There is the air peak, the air map, the wind test. Uh, I'm, I'm just talking about the air test because that's the one with which we work, okay? We work with it for five years now or four, 
maybe five years now um, uh, and so but they they are all very similar okay and to, like I said I was talking about the test that we use at 30 Central because uh, that's with it that we have more experience because they test a lot of genes they include 248 genes and we know how to interpret their results and they have a nice algorithm so this is why we've been working uh, with this test for for quite a while now um, so i really think it is important because this kind of problems uh, affect three in every 10 cases of recurrent implantation failure uh, we find a lot but a, a lot of women with displacements in the window of implantation um, there is um, a certain consensus in the scientific community about the importance of these tests um, and so um, I mean either if it's the ERA test or the ERA map or the ERA peak or the wind test and I'm certainly forgetting other names that are in the market I'm sorry for their many to their manufacturers but um, I uh, I mean, this is, but whatever studies of endometrial receptiveness based on the window of implantation factors, uh, I will certainly recommend them. Uh, and I think among all of these tests for recurrent implantation failures, this is probably the number one test to be made because it's the one that we are more likely to find. So when we are doing, uh, looking like i said in my presentation sometimes we don't know why treatments are not working and so we have to start with the problems that we are more likely to find and then go to the ones that we are less likely to find and the ura test is the one that's more likely to to be there all right thank you so much for another great explanation here yeah. i do believe it has been helpful and yeah. just one more follow-up from the very same patient that might be our final question so if you have more go ahead type those in and the question is is it always done a month before transfer is scheduled uh well not exactly because there is a logistics problem because you know when we are doing a, a ERA test we it takes more or less 21 days to prepare the, the endometrium. We do the biopsy. We get the result in about two to three weeks. Let's make it three weeks. So when we stop the medication, the patient has her menstruation more or less a week to 10 days later. And so when she bleeds, we still don't have the result. So we lose the cycle. Uh, we have to wait for the next cycle. Obviously, if the patient is on menopause, we don't lose that cycle. Uh, sometimes we can manipulate things with the pill. Sometimes we can even start the cycle and wait for the result to arrive in the middle of it and, uh, and, 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 and start immediately. So there are ways to, to, to solve this problem. But typically we would lose a cycle between the cycle where we did the ERA test and the cycle where we do the embryo transfer. But, uh, but we can lose more time. These results are typically valid for nine months. So after nine months, uh, we should repeat it because uh, these profiles can sometimes change for multiple different reasons. Understood. Again, thank you so much for the clarification. And uh, as I mentioned, it looks like that was our final question. So thank you so much, everyone, for not yet, sorry, I think. <laughs> yeah, it is okay, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Let me just show you this. Thank you. Thank you for this interesting webinar and for fine advice. I'm now in the waiting weeks of last cryo, but with this advice, I can move on after this if needed, hoping that this one will stick. Thank you so much for this comment. I wasn't sure if it's a question, but it's a comment. Thank you so much. And of course, as always, Dr. Vladimiro, I'm sure you will agree with me. Fingers crossed. Best of luck, right? Yes. Yeah, good luck to everyone. Thanks for listening to me. There are people here that listen to my three webinars, which is incredible. And uh, we don't very, mind. <laughs> I'm very <laughs> grateful. Poor Caroline, you have to listen to all of them. <laughs> anytime, uh, really, anytime. No problem uh, okay. at all. <laughs> so, guys, so. good luck for everyone. Uh, thanks for listening to me. If you have other questions, feel free to write me or email me. Or,
whatever, uh, and um, have a good night and especially good luck for all of your treatments everywhere in the world. Always. Fingers crossed. So thanks a lot, everyone, for joining us tonight. And uh, as you know, we are slowly approaching to finish before our Christmas break. So this uh, there will be one more webinar next week on Tuesday. Uh, but I would like to thank everyone for joining us uh, tonight, but also for, for all the previous times. And of course, Dr. Silva, it's definitely a pleasure to have you here. You can have even five webinars if you wish in one week. I don't have a problem with that. So uh, <laughs> you know, any, any time. And I know that we will have some more. I'm already looking forward to those. Uh, I do hope to see you soon. And everyone, have a good evening. And you too. And best Merry, of luck. Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. It's this time okay, we are yeah. getting to this, right? So Merry exactly. Christmas as well. And also just let me mention that, of course, uh, you can find this webinar tomorrow on my heavy offenses. And there are all previous webinars right there. Uh, also with Dr. Vladimir Silva, not only this week, but before that, he did a couple of webinars. So if you find it interesting, I am sure that you will also find those interesting. So go ahead, check those. And thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank Bye. You, Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.